Good evening, everybody. This is Matt Carty. This is the European Parliament in Strasbourg. For the 23rd time, this is not the RTE News. So we haven't done this in a while. We did it in November, and actually in November, we hadn't done it in a while as well. Um, we're just getting a little bit lazy with this, but we're going to try and up our game. But if you haven't watched it before, um, let me explain how this works. So basically, it's our opportunity as Sinn Féin MEPs to explain a little bit about the work that we're doing over here in the European Parliament and also to introduce you to some of our friends and comrades who we get um, to work with. It's also your chance to participate in the conversation by commenting below if I can figure out my yeah, Facebook, I will do it in a second. And uh, send your comments and questions if you have any for the panel or any um, little anecdotes that you want to share with us. Tell us your story. And then you also are asked to hit share so that more people will hear the good word of the Sinn Féin team and in the European so that Parliament. And have the opportunity to win a mug. See, <laughs> Emma has been here so often that she knows the crack. <laughs> Towards a United Ireland mugs, much sought after as always. Anybody who shares... The next episode, we'll do a little bit of a draw and one of those people will win a mug. But tonight, I also have a very big announcement to make because we're going to try and make sure that we can do what other shows do and we're going to have a big prize, but not tonight. In March, we're going to be holding um, one of our Towards the United Ireland conference series. So we've had conferences in Dublin, in Cork, in Letterkenny, in Belfast, in London. We're bringing one of those conferences to the European Parliament in Brussels in March. And next show, which is going to take place, let me get it right, on the Wednesday, the 30th of January, which will be the next show of the, not the RT News. Is today the 30th of January? No, it's not. <laughs> today is the 16th of January. Well, then you missed your own show. What date do you think it is? The 16th of January. Yeah. So it can't be taking place on the 13th of January unless you have time. 30th. 30th. Oh, sorry. 30th. Excuse. Okay. Sorry. Um, we're <laughs> removing Lynn from um, participation in that. So what we're doing on the 30th, that's 30th, or um, a three, a nudge, a U, a Gasafada um, of Anor, January, that is in two weeks' time, we're going to be having a competition that will allow people to win prizes, to be part of the delegation, to actually travel over, we'll get the flights covered, the accommodation covered, to come over. Isn't that a great prize? Yeah. That's a great prize. So in two weeks' time. So get excited. Mark it in the diary, <laughs> 8 o'clock on the 30th of January. Save the, the date. We, that's you find out when you tune in in two weeks' time. In other words, I need to figure I need out. To prepare. I need to figure out what exactly we're going to do in terms of... But let me first introduce, while I try and figure out, what we're doing. Lynn Boylan. Oh, yes. Who has already um, interrupted me. Um, <laughs> I hope you're not like that in trialogue meetings. Um, interrupt them with false information or Only misinformed information. Their accent is from Cavan Monaghan. Lynn, <laughs> Lynn Boylan is from Dublin. She's the member of the European Parliament for the constituency of Dublin. Thanks a million for coming back, back no on. Emma all. Clancy, who um, has been on this show more often than I have, <laughs> is a special advisor on economic and monetary affairs for the GUI NGL group. That's the group that we're part of and we also have another repeat guest this is your second time on how yeah. that's very few i don't think we've had anybody no. outside of the champagne team on twice can i can, so, can i come to the prize no. <laughs> yeah you, well you can come oh, to the okay, conference okay, yeah okay. but we're not paying for your flights oh. <laughs> but um, okay marisa matthias um, Hmm? Sorry, Matthias. <laughs> oh, I'm being no, Matthias. I always yes. call you Matthias and you've never no corrected problem. me. So, I yeah. like you, so. Yeah, so that's okay. Marie, Marisa is a Portuguese MEP representing yeah. the Les, Lep Bloco um, party in po Portugal, um, one of the great progressive MEPs here in the European Parliament. So thanks very much for everybody. So now, while I'm trying to figure out how to work my Facebook and see if there's any comments coming through or if there's anybody actually watching, Lynn, yes. I want you to tell our viewers, to give them a world excuse, exclusive, what's going to happen with Brexit. You have well, 30 it, seconds while I figure out how this works. <laughs> it's as clear as this crystal ball here in front of yes. us. Um, I think, look, it's absolute shambles. Um, we could probably use harser language, maybe a clusterfuck is what I've heard one person mm -hmm. uh, refer to it as. But uh, I think for anybody who watched what happened last night... Um, I'm actually was only half paying attention. Did you seriously swear on my show? This is I for didn't, no, uh, people of all, out. a family show. <laughs> okay, go on. Um, no, look, it's an absolute shambles, but um, I think it proves the point that the British Parliament has absolutely zero regard 
for the island of Ireland or for the impact um, that their actions take on the island of Ireland. And if, if you were in any doubt up to this point, if you watched last night, um, the outcome of that vote, then I think, you know, the only thing we can have now is to push for the border poll because we are certainly not going to get any favours or anything good for Ireland out of uh, Westminster. Marisa, Lynn has shown while she's so successful in politics because she managed to avoid entirely the question that I actually yeah. asked. What's going to happen with Brexit? I, I was hoping to hear from you, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, but I, I, oh, want, I okay, want you to tell okay. me to see if you, if you know what uh, you know it as no, well. But honestly, yeah. it's, it has been so long, and on, seeing from outside, uh, Theresa May is playing a very, very. Okay, I feel a little bit. Shamed. Well, her, the vote is happening right, or the debate in advance of yeah, the, the vote but, is starting right now. Yeah. But yeah, the British authorities are just playing, I think, and not and and with some red lines which are completely impossible to to, to take into account, like the, the the border, or even the issue of the free circulation of people and workers. And we know that there are like three million point five. Uh, people from European Union living in the United Kingdom and more than one million and a half of British people living outside the uh, United Kingdom in other European countries. So it's a little bit, I don't know, seeing from outside, really I feel a little bit ashamed. Is it a big uh, issue in Portugal? Are people talking about Brexit a lot? Or? Yeah, it, yeah, it is. Uh, people talk a lot about it and... Uh, and uh, and especially people talk about empty things because we don't know. We don't know. Everything which was expected to mm. be done was not. But and it's not, it doesn't create the existential crisis in Portugal. It, you, Britain wouldn't be a major trading partner of no, uh, Portugal? No, uh, Britain and Portugal, you know. We have a very long relationship, is perhaps. Okay, not Fellow equal, colonialists not, uh, one yeah, back yeah, in the day. Yeah, yeah, the, you were, uh, you were invading, invading uh, I, I countries trying, around the same time. I, if I was I trying yeah. to find the time, you know, to say that exactly that. Mm. But uh, in any case, that mm, that means also that there's a huge Portuguese community in the UK. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, it is a subject because of that, because especially the rights and okay, yeah, yeah, and okay. especially in the national health serv uh, system in in the UK, there are a lot of nurses and uh, practitioners from Portugal. So, yeah, there's a concern mainly due to the high level of Portuguese people living in the UK. Okay, I, is I, there going to be a second referendum? Would you Let me answer yeah. the first question you asked everyone else first. Which was, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, is there going so, to be a second referendum? I think that Theresa May will win the no-confidence vote. Um, and why wouldn't she? Yes. Yeah, um, from if you're... Yeah. I think there'll be a big... Who wants to do her job? There'll be a big <laughs> intensification for an extension of Article 50 and the March 29 deadline. Um, I think she's only... So you reckon the British government will make an application to extend Article 50? No, I think that there'll be a lot of political pressure, particularly from the Labour Party and okay. uh, and others, um, and, and and people forces within the EU for an extension of Article 50 uh, or for yeah of the deadline. Um, I think that there's going to be. Uh, I mean, I mean, she's only postponing the inevitable. I think there needs to be a general election, and I think that the real politics and the real interesting fascinating discussions that are actually happening now are taking She's place coming in the in British Labour Party. coming in with our Corbynista propaganda here. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, general election. No, what difference would a general election make? No. Sure, even with the Labour Party, but their position is... Yeah. What is their position? Well, they, they're going to negotiate a better deal. They're, well, they're going to negotiate a softer Brexit. I think the idea of the single market and the customs union is... And that that's what they would go to the electorate with. But I think it's like you've got to caution about saying predicting anything because I think at this stage now everybody has said so many things and oh, sure, they've just sure. been proven wrong. Yeah. But yeah, she's going to win the motion of no confidence. Nobody in the Tory party wants to be in her position because they know, even though they won't admit it, no one is getting a better deal with those red lines. If you go in with those red lines, you're not getting a better deal than what Theresa May got. But des despite being, you know, labelled as a Corbynista, <laughs> which I'm perfectly happy to be oh. called, <laughs> um, I think the the issue with the Br with the British Labour position uh, is not that they're anti-Irish or not that they don't actually take into account the. Yeah, but they were still uttering some no, crazy stuff around the backstop. Even. Yes, but the backstop. The, their issue with the backstop was that they were going to be bound by these rules without actually having a say in um, how the rules were formulated. 
And so that wasn't necessarily a thing of saying we don't want to, you know, get like we, we want to get rid of the backstop completely. It was more a matter of saying uh, we want to do this in a different way where we still have a voice if we're still going to be part of these structures. Still a bit fucking hypocritical. A absolutely, them, absolutely. And, and obviously, the we are, in terms of the, our priority know. has to be, you know, absolutely no backsliding on the backstop. And that, you know, that needs to be the position of everyone in Ireland, like every political force and every political party. Um, but I'm just explaining that, I mean, I mean, I think there's been a lot of misrepresentation of the British Labour position, which I'm trying to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that the, any extension of Article 50 would only happen if there's a concrete proposal. So either you're going to have this cross-party yep. position that they'll eventually agree, well, what can we agree on? And we yep. go to Europe with that, or else they have a general election and they say, give us time to have a general election and come back with another position because the election will be fought. But is part of the problem. Or, or a second referendum. Otherwise, the EU are going to say, no, we're not going to just but delay indefinitely. We've had, so Labour, can continue we've to had have Labour MEPs, shambles. British Labour MEPs on this show. There's four or five who I'd imagine would be only too delighted to come on to this show. If you had the five of them, you get five different answers <laughs> yeah, as to yeah, what yeah. exactly it is you yeah. would like to see in a second deal. But so Emma is the correct one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 the, yeah. She's got a direct First, line to uh, Jeremy. Line. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. But but if there's a postponement, then what will happen with the European elections? Because then you'll run for the elections. No, no. You, mm, yeah. The members uh, from uh, UK will run for the elections, and then it will not be a postponement till June. It will be for five years at least, mm. I think. No. So are you all you guys saying? No deal is very unlikely, Either, or I th it's also the possibility of the hard Brexit. No, uh, no deal uh, with no postponement and uh, no agreement and nothing. nothing. There, there is a very Which. big possibility of a no deal, but there's going to be a massive intensification of all sorts of efforts mm -hmm. in the next very, very short amount of time um, to try to avoid that situation. But if there's no agreement, if there's no postponing of uh, the this discussion and no agreement till there and no whatever. What will happen is that in the 29th of March the border will be implemented. That's the issue, isn't it? But it won't. That won't happen because who's going to implement it? In the sense that okay, it will be because it'll start to become a problem for businesses, but nobody. People, you, yeah, countries will be allowed to file complaints against Britain for you know, discriminating against them as opposed to their approach to mm. Ireland. But there's apparently a national security waiver that they can invoke under the WTO. So there, it's ex it's just, there's so many <laughs> extremely no, but complex... The one that you, we, and everybody's been calling us, you know, divisive or not everybody, um, the usual suspects, for saying that in such a scenario there then has to be a, a poll in yeah. relation yeah. to a United Ireland. That's Ireland's honestly the only, the only... I mean, I mean, of course, I'm an Irish Republican. That's what I want to see. Like, ideologically, politically, that's what I want to see. But actually, practically, looking at this sham shambles, that that is actually the only... And thank you feasible. for using more appropriate language than Lynn. <laughs> I'm from <Tala. laughs> OK, so we're going to move on. But so, so the answer in relation to Brexit is, quite honestly, we do not have a clue no, what is going to happen. No. The only thing Referendum, we know... Referendum, yeah, unity There poll. are people who are getting paid huge sums of money to be experts in this field. Like, it was amazing looking at the... Sterling last night hardly moved. It actually went up a bit in value <laughs> uh, oh, okay. as a result. But you would have to say, um, and before, if you're a Brexiteer, you, they were nuts to vote against that deal last night in many respects because yeah. that's probably as good of a Brexit yeah. as mm. they're going to get yeah. in, from their point mm. of view in terms of being removed because you know, all the trajectories, if there's going to be any opening of a debate yeah. or um, um, uh, negotiating with the European Union, it's going to be for a softer Brexit. It's no way yeah. these guys are going to go and sit it down and say, let's go. It won't happen unless there's another general election. Yeah. Yeah. The Corbynist uh, <laughs> propaganda here again. <laughs> this week in Parliament, actually for the past couple of weeks, um, we've been looking at images. There's been big, uh, in flashing lights, the Euro at 20 today. We had to listen to Jean-Claude Trichet, he was the guy who said the bomb would go off in Dublin if there was any burden share, and that was about a week before the EU decided that there had to be burden sharing yeah. everywhere else. We had Absolute Mario Dra Draghi. Um, oh, Jesus, we're going <laughs> 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 Welcome to the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, um, we had, um, of course, Juncker, and we had his, um, his successor in waiting, Weber, all telling us that 
the euro has been this phenomenal success politically and economically. That's I, fair I enough, is it, the, Emma, in I terms of? I think the euro should invite us all out for drinks and, and pay for it with the euro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrate its birthday. Is that a fair analysis, that it's been a success politically and economically? Well, it's, it's an, you know, again, it's a very complex issue because the euro has been so... Um, uh, the impact of the euro has been completely different on different countries and on different groups of people. And so, for example, you had people in Ireland and Portugal and the so-called periphery who view the, like m many of whom view the euro as this very positive thing because it meant a massive expansion of credit, which then, you know, mm -hmm. raised li living standards and uh, basically prompted the, um, the Celtic Tiger and all sorts of things. But I think what we can say is that 20 years after the creation of the euro, um, the fundamental flaws in the way that it was structured became very, very clear in 2007, 2008 during the financial crisis. And pretty much nothing has happened since then to actually resolve those contradictions and those problems that will help prepare us for the future inevitable crisis, which is coming in you know, the next three years or so because of the massive level of over-indebtedness mm -hmm. of the economy in, in the world. Has the euro been a success from a Portuguese perspective, Marisa? It depends the Portuguese people you ask. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For me, no. For me, okay. no. And why not? No, I think that not even those who are here celebrating Jean-Claude Trichet and Mario Draghi, not even them believe it was a success. And Mario Draghi is from Italy. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. He's of course, <laughs> of course no. the but, Euro but has just been this great the, success. Perhaps the secret uh, issue about Euro, which um, brings everyone to say, OK, at the end it was more or less a success, is because nobody expected it to be. Want breaking news? Uh, breaking news? I should get a sort no, of a no, thing. Breaking news. No, I have breaking news. Oh, sorry. Theresa sorry. May has won by yeah. 325 to 306. No, the, thanks the to breaking... scribbler scribbling for <laughs> what a surprise. that update. Yes, so sorry, what? my no, apologies. Let's go back we, to the euro. All, all of our predictions were correct. Yes, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> no, I was, so go back I, to the I euro. I was saying and that when the euro was introduced, um, there were several People, there were several people saying that it wouldn't last not even 10 years. Mm. It was impossible because we don't have a proper budget uh, which can accommodate a common uh, currency. Uh, and also because of all the faults that uh, Emma was referring to, but mainly the limits that we have concerning the, the ECB and all these issues and the, 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 the obsession with the uh, inflation we say, do we say? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. uh, issues and all these things, okay, is not prepared. And, and in, after the crisis or during the crisis, which was never properly solved, uh, Mario Draghi, Draghi moved in a way to save the, the currency. Mm. That's, that's completely true. But if we face a new crisis, I don't think that it will survive, to be mm. honest. Because what was his quote that he basically said, you know, the, the, Whatever needs to be done, whatever, to, whatever it takes. Yeah, to whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Euro, it, that was, was going it, to yeah, be done. Yeah, yeah. whatever it takes. And if that resulted yeah. in, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it was, hundreds it was, of thousands yeah. of more but people, people living true. in abject poverty, that but was the price to our No, no, no. That that particular quote was about creating a new uh, monetary instrument, which has actually yeah. never been used. Okay. But the fact that it got the backing of the German state, the fact that Mario Draghi was able to convince Germany to say, okay, you know, we'll back this extraordinary monetary instrument, that was what saved the euro um, yeah. from absolutely, t from total collapse in 2012. Yeah. But the thing is, we still have, um, see, the, the euro, peop like, people, like people who are, you know, going to the shop and spending their euros, it's notes and it's coins. But what the euro is at the end of the day is a system of rules. And so the worst, like it's, the euro is 20 years old, but you have to look back to 1992 when the Maastricht Treaty was mm. basically created, yeah. the you know created the uh, the forerunner of the euro, and that was based on the politics and the ideology of that particular time, which was Thatcherism, Reaganism, and so we're stuck with this currency, yeah. which is the set of rules, which is based on outdated, provenly false, mm. ridiculous. She's very intelligent, isn't she? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ridiculous mm. notions about. Um, how a common currency should work. And so the whole project of the euro was to cause convergence across the But it was a EU. political project much yes, more absolutely. than an economic yeah. project. They, they it was knew, always they, about... Exactly. They knew that they could never, you know, just say, OK, all of the nations of the EU, now you're just one nation, so we'll, we'll create this common currency to try to 
uh, be a backdoor to but the, fir the, the funny thing is, if you look at the omni shambles, as I would use it to yep. use more um, um, discerning language than <laughs> some of my co colleagues of where the British are, if they were tied into the euro, there, it would be like a whole, you'd be able to yeah. use your own term <laughs> yeah, there. But, it would be a cluster. Know, but I think in one way, um, the countries which decided to integrate this common currency were those who had something to gain yes. in a short period. Mm. For instance, for Italy, it was the magic a maneuver to fight yeah. inflation because they could not control at all yeah. the currency. It was crazy with Lira. For Ireland, Portugal, yep. and other peripheral countries, it was access this capacity of having lower yeah. rates. Yeah. And people yeah. could have access to but things. But the real winners? Germany and France. Mm -hmm. Germany, <laughs> yeah. Germany. Yeah. Germany. Was. But France also because of in order to control and to give something to Germany, but mainly Germany, of course. I mean, you're probably too young to remember the introduction of the euro, are you? I, do you know what I remember about the introduction of the Tell euro? Me. The end of the penny suite. <laughs> <laughs> they still have cents. They suites, don't do have they? penny suites anymore. No, they well, don't. Well, you can't even get pennies <laughs> or even one cent or two cents anymore. They got rid of them in Ireland. You Didn't can't get no. two cents. I, I had a job remember, selling penny suites. Okay. I remember getting a one pound of my neighbour for my communion and going in and getting a hundred penny suites. One of my all-time favourite memories. You wouldn't get that for a euro. <laughs> yeah, so... What does this? Okay, so from our my perspective, I believe that signing up to the euro was one of the most economically um, stupid mistakes that lots of countries, including ours, For made. For Portugal, it meant uh, you more divergence and and adjustments through salaries and to labour rights and all the things. But nobody that in their right mind at this point could argue that countries like ours would leave the euro either because that would create no, a huge I, I, I financial think, instability I as think, well. Yeah, I think we cannot... Uh, in, it, it was a, such a huge level of integration with the euro. I think it's the major mm. integration level that you can get at the European Union. It's, it's the, the common currency. So, of course, there are a lot of... Uh, complicated issues if you decide to <laughs> get out of it in a lilateral way. In mm. countries like Ireland, to walk away from the euro, you still owe yeah. the money, but, but you I, then owe it I in think, a weaker I currency. I think the real issue, I think, it's, I think you need to have an actual mechanism where you're allowed legally to leave the euro if you want to as a state like you have an Article 50. I think Without you need leaving an article, the EU, though, overall? Yeah, I yeah, think okay. you need an Article 50 to be able to exit the Eurozone. Not that I'm advocating anyone should do that, because I think it would be totally shambolic. It, you know, it would be another disaster. But it would actually provide states like Greece, for example, in their situation that they were in, with some more negotiating power when they're negotiating with the ECB. But what really needs to happen with the euro is you need to have a rewriting of the rules. So you need to have flexibility mechanisms when it comes to you know, saying that all, all euros are equal, but some are actually more equal than others. Yeah. Um, and you, you also need to have this, uh, you know. Well, isn't the problem, in order, if you were to ever get that, the price that you would have to pay is further Political union in terms yes, of yeah, and absolutely. you know that's something that I don't think we would be too eager yeah. to sign up to. Yeah, it's it's really complicated as an issue, but uh, but it's also true that all these faults that we identify and everybody, including those in charge of the currency and those who believe in it, uh, something to serve Germany, I don't care. But all even those they realize that we are talking about facts. We are not talking about opinions. It was bad mm. for a yeah. lot, for several economies, for several countries. Yeah. It was really, really bad in terms of the, the economic consequences, and we, it took and us, really, really good for yeah, Germany. Yeah, but for Portugal, in this, for instance, in these 20 years, 19 of them were of divergence. Mm -hmm. The only, the last one was the only one that we didn't assist to a major divergence, but. It has to do mainly with the policies which have been applied in, applied in Portugal by the government rather than, than the euro but, thing. But this is, I, I think this is actually the critical issue of the entire debate around the left's approach to Europe because you have on the one hand, I'll be quick, <laughs> stop yes. staring at your phone. No. <laughs> you have on the one hand um, a demand by progressives for more economic integration, you know, a deepening of the economic and monetary union 
And but they're saying it in a progressive way. way. They want to do this so that Germany's massive surplus um, can be shared and distributed. Yeah, distributed to, yeah. But the, but the thing is, I think the left needs to take a position against any further integration yeah. because mm. in the, in these circumstances with these political balance of forces, all of the all of that further integration, while in theory, you know, in abstract economic theory, it might actually produce a more you know effective mm. functioning monetary union. What it requires is a political trade-off where we have to give more and more powers from the member states. So you want a EU unemployment insurance scheme. You have to, you know, hand over all power over your labour market yeah. to Brussels. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get talking about vulture funds for a second. Lynn, will you give me a number between 1 and 30, please? On oh, my age, 25. <laughs> <laughs> 25, yeah. Where did I see 25 there? I mean, I've, done, I've jumbled it up, oh, okay. haven't just done it in chronological order. And it's Richard Gohan. Richard Gohan, so fair play to Richard, has won. Good question in relation to um, Germany from um, Jonathan Scales. He reckons that Germany's on the brink of recession and wondering what that would mean in terms of implications for the euro and for will all of Europe change its financial policies and economic policies when it's Germany that are in the fire line? Or are, is Germany on the brink of recession? I don't think Germany's on the brink of recession at the moment, but they are having an, an extreme kind of shift in their economic model because of the re reforms that were brought in. So would we all need to act in solidarity with our the, German friends? The, the German workers among EU workers are among the most screwed over people at the moment. Like yeah. their, their yeah, wages have just absolutely plummeted. Yeah. It's their export economy. So now they don't. They're still trying to well, export. They need to stop voting for the CDU for a start. Yes, right? Or yes, the yes, AFD absolutely. for that matter. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, Sorry, Lynn, I want to move just because um, we only have a couple of minutes, unfortunately, but um, repossessions, big issue in my own constituency. Mm. Is it an issue in Dublin yet? Oh, no, it is. It's, it is and a evictions? big issue and particularly, well, and evictions. I mean, we know that the, the numbers of, of repossessions, what the, I suppose the mainstream media will tell you is that it's quite low compared to other countries, but we do know that the purchasing of distressed mortgages is ramping up by vulture funds and that we're reaching a tipping point. Um, so repossessions, yes, they are happening, um, but particularly around the buy to rent properties that mm -hmm. are just being taken back. Yeah. People who are in the rental market are being then given notice to quit. The house is being sold over to vulture funds, but not sold back to the people who took out the mortgage at the reduced fee. So it, yes, it is a big problem, but the, the, I mean, it's not just Dublin. The housing situation at the moment in Ireland is a completely broken system at every point from the public housing to the, the, the mortgages, to the rental system. Everything is just broken about. So of the course, housing. the European Commission are going to come in with a proposal for a directive that's going to improve the situation. Is that right, Emma? Yes, I like to call it the Vulture Fund Directive. I I think Lynn is absolutely right, and you should actually devote an entire episode mm. to talking mm. about the housing, the housing crisis in Ireland. But um, this proposal basically uh, is to replicate the Irish model, NAMA, you know, a public bad bank, publicly funded bad bank, um, invite in the vulture fund, send in the debt collectors. They want to use this terrible Irish model mm. as a success story and impose <laughs> it across the rest of the EU. And we're launching a major campaign against it in the coming weeks. So please we'll be pay attention doing, to We'll be doing a video media. on that and we'll be getting it sent out. Um, Marisa, um, housing in terms of housing provision, evictions, um, repossessions, has it been a, um, a, a threat it was, in It was a Portuguese major politics? problem in Portugal, a major problem during the Troika intervention. A lot of uh, uh, thousands of families lost their houses and uh, they, they couldn't pay and they, and they lost their houses and they had to still they still have to pay to the bank after losing yeah. the house, mm -hmm. even not having the property anymore. So uh, some legislation was modified. Now what is at stake is to really clarify that when someone lo loses the house, you don't have to pay anything after delivering it to the bank. It's not still clear like that, but a lot of improvements were done. It's still a problem, but not like... Uh, we saw it mm. was a tragedy, in fact, during the, the trike yeah. intervention. It was okay. a tragedy.
Okay, well, listen, um, I think we're going to have to really have an EU-wide campaign against this um, directive because it's only going to be civic pressure that will work. And particularly in advance of the European elections, now is the time to actually hit home and, yeah. and, and force and, those and parties. And we don't want to improve the proposal, we want to get rid of it completely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think people yeah. understand fundamentally the unfairness of vulture funds, that when someone is in distress, that they can't even enter into a bite, a, a rental system for mm. life, do you mean, or they yeah. can't get the debt right down, but that the bank is quite happy to then sell their house off at a, like a, a 60, 70 yeah. percent and, discount. And the vulture funds There's get a, a bad rep, but it's yeah. actually the banks that yeah. are, you know, I mean, and that's bad. for yeah. anybody can see how deeply unfair that I is. I started to see even wondering how we were going to fill a half an hour, and yet here we are <laughs> at the end of a half an hour. Keep sharing. Richard Gohan has won uh, towards the United Ireland mug. It could be you, but we need you to keep sharing because we want to get um, this out. Don't forget, we're back on the 30th. 3 0 T H, 30th of January, where we're going to have a competition for somebody to actually win a trip to Brussels to participate in our Towards a United Ireland Conference. So please tune in then, and we'll see you then. And in the meantime, solidarity with our nurses. They're going to be, unfortunately, on the picket line, unless Pascal Donoghue and oh, Simon can Harris I get, a plug get their about act my together. Conference? Plug okay. something? Yep. Okay. 21st of January, Monday, uh, we have uh, Professor A.V. Chomsky over from America talking about the Colombian coal mine, that the ESB, which is a semi-state body, the government has the majority shareholder, is buying its 90% of its coal from, and uh, there's huge problems with human rights violations in that mine. So it's this Monday coming, and um, there's a lunchtime conference, half 12 to 2, in the European Parliament office in Dublin, and then a longer conference that night in the United Trade Union building at 7 p.m. Yeah. And we, all, we also have to send our solidarity from everyone in Sinn Féin to Layla, the HDP MP. Yes, Martina was over at the yeah, weekend. Yeah, exactly. She's in a critical condition in hospital and 160 more Kurdish um, political prisoners have joined her on hunger strike. OK, solidarity to everyone. We'll see you on the 30th of uh, January. Shlangafal. We have to do this. It's a classic, Marisa. You I don't know. It. It's a <laughs> if I cannot dance, it's not my revolution. I can't believe we actually ran out of time. I'm the plug. It was three interesting topics, so yeah, it's fine.